as you can see on the screen, my project is on virtual reality. Um, first of all, my name is Mark, and today we'll be looking at specifically past progresses we've made using virtual reality as all of humanity, and the leaps and bounds that technology can bring us to accomplish future um, iterations and future implementations using this specific technology. So to start off, we should probably go over the outline of this presentation. So real quick, we're going to go through some background inf information, some current implementations that we have, um, possible future implementations that are more on the experimental side, um, and then get into the real mean bones and really tied in with this course, looking at exponential growth of tech and VR and what the future has in store for us. And of course, with, with that, we're going to be looking at possible challenges any concerns that might come about if we try to implement this uh, technology further given that it grows as the years progress. So, like I said, we're going to go through the background and let's talk about the history first. The history of the word virtual has changed over the centuries. In the 1400s, in the mid-1400s, the definition of virtual was actually in the essence of, or to the effect of, though not actually there. But however, currently, um, the definition has changed to not physically existing, but made to appear by software. So, although the implications of the definitions are very similar, and to essentially mean the same thing, there's a heavier emphasis on computation and software, projecting out the idea that we are now in a com computer technology kind of era or age. So one of the first inventions um, of modern day uh, virtual reality was actually through uh, Morn Helix Sensorama. So this was in the 1960s, early 1960s, where he created this device where essentially he would show clips, very short clips, and he would, um, sh um, they would have the effect of 3D, wide vision, and he'd also tease and play out other senses um, using motion, um, aromas, and even wind. And the reason why that is so cool is because that's what they had in the 1960s. But in today's um, current uh, virtual reality technology, a lot of the things that people have on the market really only play aspects to audio and visual cues. And because this is so far back, at least 80 years, almost a century now, we can really appreciate how, how, um, how pioneers in this field have really tried and tried to um, put effort into this um, technology. So another, uh, a quick side note. So about two, three weeks ago, I watched the movie, the new Terminator movie. I know it's still going on, which is crazy to me. Um, but I watched it in this new um, thing that they've implemented, sort of new thing that they've implemented in North America called 4D, which essentially uses fans, scents, uh, as well as uh, vibrations from the seats in order to make the um, movie, the experience more immersive. And like I said before, this is what's happening now, and this is something that's been present since almost a century ago. And uh, that just kind of like puts into perspective how amazing um, uh, Helig was. Uh, some more history. Um, the first ever head-mounted display of VR um, goes to the uh, fellas, uh, Ivan Sutherland and his colleagues. Um, and this was also in around mid 1960s. However, that's not necessarily what you would think of when you think of a VR headset. As you can see, it's quite large and clunky, and it only like you only see two like reticles right there. Modern day, um, modern day virtual headsets you might think of looks more something more similar to something like this, the Nintendo Virtual Boy, and this was this was brought out in mid 1990s. This is very important because this was the very first ever attempt by a large um, technology entertainment company to attempt uh, virtual reality. But because it was the first generation type of thing, as many first generation technologies um, do, they fell sort of they fell sort of flat when it came out to actually getting sales and actually doing what they were supposed to do effectively. First of all, you can see that 
it only offers um, black and red colors. And that was primarily due to the constraints that it had in technology and that the red bulbs would last longer and they'd be more reliable. Um, additionally, it caused migraines in individuals and they had to cancel it for future shipments and there's a little bit of time where virtual reality was kind of kept uh, from progressing just because it, uh, previous uh, works were not successful. Uh, right, so th there are many different types of VR. Um, I'll go over all of these eventually. Uh, I'll go over the first three first, immersive virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and then later onwards, I'll go over simulated reality. So, one of the, mentioned, uh, one of the types I mentioned was immersive virtual reality, IVR. And there are two different types, HMD, which stands for the Head Mounted Display, and CAVE, which stands for Computer Assisted Virtual um, Environment. So we already mentioned what HDM kind of looks like, right? You've got a headset display, and you can use your headphones to kind of further immerse yourself, but it primarily only targets your audio sensory, um, audio and visual um, um, senses. However, the CAVE system is much more immersive. So, in, uh, at the Zurich uh, University of Arts, they actually have rooms that are that play more to more of your senses, where they even have hydro, uh, hydraulic platforms so that they can simulate certain feelings. And because it's on a wider screen, you don't have certain issues that the HDM um, system has. Another type of uh, reality, uh, virtual reality we have is augmented reality. And this is a little more popular, I'd say, uh, I would argue actually, because of its wide implementation. So what is augmented reality? It integrates different interactive digital elements, and it, like, such as the digital overlays and haptic feedback in order to uh, bring um, these simulated things into the real world. And most popularly, one of the, one of the most uh, recognizable um, technologies uh, or softwares that we, uh, that we developed was with Pokemon Go, as many of you might know. Uh, and I would argue many of you must have probably attempted to play. So this, this is something that was widespread and global. And it was, um, it was a big hit, even though there were a lot of bugs. But people were very interested in something that was used in entertainment and recreation and just kind of rekindled some of that, um, that uh, childhood that some people had. Additionally, I would argue that even though it's less recognizable, Snapchat is a lot more frequently used um, uh, as a type of augmented reality. So you can see here, that's a picture I took this morning with the old, old age filter where it made me look older than I actually am. So, I mean, even though like these things aren't um, groundbreaking in a sense where um, they have necessarily soci big societal impacts, you, you know, there, there are, it, it is something that is uh, being frequently used by many individuals of various ages. Uh, the next type of virtual reality is Mixed, uh, mixed reality. So this one's actually pretty interesting because it combines both immersive virtual reality and augmented reality and that you can have a more interaction type of experience. And so what this image is, is actually of, um, it's supposed to like um, display what the hall lens is supposed to look like. Used by medical students at the Case Western um, Reserve University in Cleveland. So what actually happened was that they partnered with uh, Microsoft and they were able to provide um, this type of experience for medical students. And importantly, what this technology provided them was they could uh, examine obscure points of view that would, you would never be able to see using a real cadaver. So it kind of goes beyond physical uh, constraints and allows for more in-depth knowledge of a certain topic. So, now that we know some of the background information, we should go over current implementations of VR. And I think the best way to go about that is to actually experience it ourselves. 
So now that you've got your, um, your devices set up, um, you could probably just wake up your phone and relaunch the app if it fell asleep. And uh, just click on the cardboard demo if you guys see that. Alternatively, if you if you get if you start feeling nauseous, you can always just take out your phone from the card box, and it still works using the normal display here. But you just see two of them because that's how it works. Yeah, and for mine, it just told me to switch, rotate. So just yeah. take out your phone and rotate it if it says that. Right. Oh, I got my tour. I got one. Yeah. So, um, using your right hand, you can see that over top of your probably the middle of your pointer finger, there's a trigger on the cardboard, which will be used to actually inter interact with the demo in front of you. Uh, right, right here. Demo right here. Yeah. So there, there is a, a sense of interaction here. So yeah. So at any point in time, you can put your. Um, you can put your device vertically to bring you back to the home menu. Yeah, so it's supposed to be horizontal. Alright. Uh, not quite. <laughs> That's okay. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I think we should be all very okay. similar in this page, this page right? All right, so you should see something similar in front of you. This is just for the camera so that they don't just have to see this screen the whole time. Uh, but there are options um, once you get to the menu, and I want you to go to the very farthest right option, Arctic Journey, and then click the trigger button, if you guys see that. So, I believe you all should be there. Arctic Journey. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. So if you do see, if you do click Arctic Journey, you should be brought up to this new environment, and it has options. It says play all, fly, play, learn, create, and react. Relax. Is anyone telling you to play some All right. So so there is some troubleshooting, but that, that's all right. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. So like I mentioned before, if if it's a little if it's a little difficult, we can just use our phones directly, but we won't be as immersed in experience. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, I think everyone should be there. So if you if you tilt it vertically, you go back to the original menu. All right. So. Um, <laughs> um, if you click on Let's say fly. Is is everyone on the fly option? You you see a lot. You you see that there are definitely some visually striking um, simulations going on, and even though they're not class top top of the class uh, simulations, they are pretty interesting and it's very cool to use in terms of just primarily recreation, just having fun, and just doing something more hobby like than it is anything serious. So I believe the way you progress in this simulation is you have to use your right trigger and click on one of the birds and that will actually take you forward and it will allow you to go do the function that it's supposed to let you do and experience the simulation if it's intended to support it. So I, I hope that you all are, are seeing this. If not, I mean, as always next time, I guess. All right, so, so I'll let you keep playing with that. Um, there's another feature called Play. And so essentially what that does is it's a little more interactive in terms of its function than it is Fly. So this Play feature just lets you interact with more things in the environment and um, gives you more feedback from what you're providing um, in terms of input. So let's say, for example, um, to the camera, I guess. Let's say, for example, I um, I see these. I see what is it? What's that? It's kind of hard to show when it's you know kind of like kind of weird to show to the camera. So yeah. So interacting with certain things allow allow you to get some of the certain responses back. Yeah. I know technology can be a little 
frustrating, especially when it's uh, it's not as um, receptive. You gotta give me the, uh, but if you back. click on one of the fish, then you get a whale breaching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, just depending on what the um, app or the demo is supposed to show you, it will give you varying levels of feedback. And if your inputs all will usually result in an output, but depending, like I said, on the function or the purpose of the um, the purpose of the, the software, you'll get varying degrees. So, I guess because due to time, we won't go over each and every single one of these and make you sit around too long. But um, like I was telling Dr. Solis here. There are some more features that are more responsive and allow you to have a greater deal of um, feedback from your initial inputs. So let's look at maybe some established uh, implementations already. So maybe this is where I could ask you to help me out with some ways that we already use VR. Any Anything's come to the top of your head? These are just some lists here. Yeah. Gaming. Gaming, that's the biggest one. I think uh, we all got the chance to game in a sense here. Um, so like we've uh, established before with history, Nintendo was able to create a mediocrely successful uh, device that was intended for recreation and gaming. Um, in terms of education and training, one of the uh, first intended uses of VR was actually for training pilots to go through simulations so that that way you don't need to learn while you're already up in a dangerous situation. Research and work kind of ties in together in more like, let's say, uh, visualization of certain uh, things that are harder to visualize in real life. And health, uh, primarily I was thinking of in terms of communications and um, knowing what certain things are because of what you're allowed to see in VR. So, experimental and future implementations. I think some of you have seen this article. It was just released the 26th, which I believe might have been yesterday or the day before. And the title reads, Cows on Russian farm get fitted with VR goggles to increase milk production. And so, even though it seems silly, the person that implemented this did have some pretty reasonable um, you know, reasons as to why he wanted to do this, because in the States they already had some features where they allowed cars, uh, cars, cows to be more comfortable uh, given their conditions. However, it, because this isn't exactly proven, it seems to be along the lines of a little bit of more wishful hoping than anything. However, until you know, we get more research out there to see if this is actually something that allows the cows to be calmed down, we will never know. And I feel as though um, it, it does no harm, I think. So we'll just have to wait and see how um, things progress with that. However, on a more serious note, we could probably implement this more in health and communications. So here's just a picture of avatars, um, possibly a patient and a physician communicating in VR. So one of the things with uh, communications and health right now is it's difficult and troublesome to go out of your way to go do something that you necessarily don't want to do, especially when you're afflicted with some sort of illness or you're just not in the mood to do so. And so this kind of eliminates that barrier of of um, inconvenience and allows you to get treatment more than, uh, than you would normally need to do so. And, you know, communication is such a, 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 a critical thing in our society. Um, I'd like to point out that VR has been used in terms of communication between total strangers to discuss pretty big things that are traumatizing to individuals. So this video uh, by a YouTuber has 6.9 million views where a child pretty much talks about getting bullied in school. And it's not an isolated incident. We've also got this Korean bird like uh, avatar talking about his brother's death in a VR chat. So why couldn't we implement this in our healthcare society, uh, system where potentially a psychologist or psychiatrist 
was able to better communicate in, in the comfort of a patient's home where they're more able to express themselves and to do so more easily. So that's just, just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, there are so many different future implementations we can have. But for sure, I believe that I could argue that healthcare would be greatly benefited given what we just saw now and what we've seen with the different uh, types of virtual reality. So here are some future directions that we have for VR. So before we really talk about them, I want to just bring up this quote. I'm really sorry, guys, but we have this book, this from Bart, from Ford to the factory. Uh, we'll, we'll be done in 10 minutes. OK. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'll be done really quickly. Um, so why don't people tell, be able to teleport wherever they want? So this kind of uh, hints at the idea that why should we try to um, uh, knock down the possibilities that they're, um, that, they're, uh, that may be possible even though things may not be necessities? Additionally, um, Xbox is um, one of uh, uh, Xbox's big people uh, in their uh, pro, um, company right now is Phil Spencer, and he said that VR is an isolating experience, saying that nobody is asking for it, and so we shouldn't be putting our resources into it. However, um, a, an executive from Sony Excuse said. Me, sir. We, we will be done in seven minutes. We, we, we can't leave the room right now. This student is being graded on this. But it, just be patient. Seven minutes isn't very long in your life. Okay? Okay. Apologies. Um, so well, maybe we should skip over this. But essentially, the point being is we shouldn't always try to predict things linearly and there are always ways that we can improve our society. So tying this back to our um, course, Moore's Law, we all know what this is. This is a more recent or more possible, uh, more close future of the improvements that technology faces. And how could we um, relate that with um, virtual reality? I have this clip from um, Wall E. However, I will only show you the first 27 seconds. So this clip kind of shows you more of the possible dilemmas that people have in if you keep implementing VR um, past what uh, is necessarily healthy for society. So. That's always something to think about, and the clip has more things to talk about the future. However, due to time constraints, we won't get into. It. So, going back to this, uh, the idea of the VR and the cow. The first one of the big comments on Twitter was, "This is literally the plot of the Matrix." And so, if you think about it, and you think about the other, the last type of reality that I didn't get a chance to go about talk about was simulated reality. We have to think about things that are far beyond our possible conceptions of reality. Um, of course, we've talked about the idea of uploading your consciousness onto a, a ceramic slab. In here, I've got a, a diagram or a picture of a, a doctor USB chain, and so we could possibly um, upload a, any individual into some sort of cyberspace. In terms of these two men right here, we all know these people as Elon Musk on the left, and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson on the right, and Elon Musk um, was quoted saying, if you assume at any rate of improvement at all, games will eventually be indistinguishable from reality. And Neil deGrasse Tyson agreed, and like there, there are so many questions that come about with this in terms of how serious of these simulations need to be. Could one theoretically live in this um, uh, simulation their whole life? And the proposed game by Elon Musk was in Minecraft, given that it's so expansive that it's technically an infinite world where you could house many different people. But of course, there comes a problem of computational power and whether we are able to actually house that many people given our current um, processing power. And that's where compu uh, uh, quantum computing and VR comes into play. So we all know about the, the chip that Google released about improved uh, of, uh, in obtaining 
um, quantum supremacy, where we've got improved processing, more expensive simulations, and greater cost effectiveness. But of course, there were always these, um, there were some rebuttals about its true effectiveness and if it was really achieving quantum supremacy. But of course, there's always that promise of the possibility that we could go beyond this world and expand our own universe. All right, so we've got some challenges and concerns. Quickly, um, accessibility is the biggest one. I think in every single uh, um, presentation that we've had, accessibility has been the biggest issue in terms of those uh, in poorer countries not being able to access these even though there are various benefits in education training and all of society. Privacy, consent, and possible bullying, bullying and harassment are things that need to be regulated by some officials of some sorts, but uh, the, these are problems that will have to be uh, established uh, and resolved later on. I just want to find, uh, finish this off with this image of Moore's Law, um, because even though these ideas maybe seem far off and they are in re, um, cynically looking very far off in the future, technology has and always will be uh, continuing to improve. And that, in the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. And so we should always be looking forward to um, reaching these next leaps and bounds that technology is uh, able to provide us.